Chapter 1. Humans are wired in different ways, under different ideologies and beliefs, but one thing that's common to everyone is fear. Most acts of violence we experience aren't unexpected, even though they might come as a surprise. In most cases, the signs and red flags are always there to caution us, but we pay little to no attention to them. Many times, we escape these experiences with our intuition and guts. However, to really use the gift of fear, we need to learn how to identify the signals that are there to ensure our survival. We must learn these signals with more accuracy while training our minds to make full use of our intuitions. Fear is a huge determinant of how safe we'll live our lives. It is the emotion that can determine whether we live or die. It is the tiny switch between finding an escape and being condemned to fate. By discussing the possibility of everyone being capable of violence, we can see what we dread seeing, thereby accepting that violence is an innate feeling that needs an excuse to manifest. Using real-life examples and personal experience, Gavin De Becker has given us a manual that would help us live a safer, assured life. People should learn to see and so avoid all danger. Just as a wise man keeps away from mad dogs, so one should not make friends with evil men. Buddha. Chapter 2. Our sense of danger and intuition is the best option against violence. When Kelly agreed to let a stranger she met in her apartment help her carry the groceries to her place, she had no idea that the stranger was a serial rapist. He raped her and intended to kill her after he was done. Fortunately for Kelly, when the rapist got up to go to the kitchen, she silently escaped from her apartment and hid with her neighbors. Months later, when she narrated her ordeal with the author, who happens to be a security specialist, Kelly wondered what had made her know that her rapist had planned to kill her. Later, she discovered that on hearing her captor lock the windows, her instinct had automatically told her that it's to prevent her screams from reaching the neighbors. Had she not followed her instincts, the captor would have killed her. Our instincts are critical to our safety. When we are faced with real fear, it's what leads us away from danger. Alongside our instincts is our intuition. Our intuition sense can warn us of impending danger by calling our attention to minor but essential details. When Michael Cantrell became a police officer, he was very particular about following his intuition. He once pulled over a car with his partner David Patrick that contained three men. While David went about his police business, Cantrell sensed danger, particularly in the other two men's actions in the back seat. The two men had refused to make eye contact with Cantrell, and on seeing this as a sign of danger, he asked the driver to step out. When the driver stepped out, they realized that he had a gun in the car, on the floor. Intuition gives us a chance to examine our position and react quickly to avoid disaster. Even though he dreamt about being shot, David went ahead to pull over a car occupied by two men who fit the description of some wanted robbers. Instead of calling for backup, David decided to go all alone, and he was shot. Fortunately, he survived the gunshot without a threatening injury. Had he paid attention to his dream, he might have escaped being shot at all by the criminals. Our dreams sometimes warn us of impending danger, and it's essential we listen to it. Chapter 3. We must stop judging people's characters based on our expectations of them. People now and then say they can't envision what a given encounter would look like, but it's not true. You can imagine every human inclination, and as you'll see it, it is the capacity to do this that makes you a specialist at anticipating what others will or can do. I am capable of what every other human is capable of. This is one of the great lessons of war and life. Maya Angelou We must teach ourselves to stop trying to be a judge of characters and accept that anybody is capable of anything. To do this, we must be what William Humphrey, an American novelist, calls natural psychologists. We need to know what it means to be human. We need to realize that being human means we're fallible and capable of any evil. Famous psychologist Carl Menninger explains that he doesn't trust in such an unbelievable marvel as the criminal psyche. According to him, everybody's brain is criminal, and we're all equipped for criminal dreams and contemplations. Two of history's most cited personalities went significantly further to agree with Carl. In an unusual agreement, Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud investigated the subject of human savagery. Einstein opined that man has in him the need to detest and harm, 
while Freud agrees that humans are naturally violent. Even though we live in modern times, we still possess Stone Age minds. We are competitive, territorial, and brutal, much the same as our earliest ancestors. Some people claim that they'll never hurt or kill anyone. However, they constantly include a telling exemption, except if an individual attempted to hurt somebody I love. This means that the ability to show deadly viciousness is present in everybody. We are all equipped with the ability to be violent, and the only thing that's different is our view of the justification to do evil. As much as we would love to trust people, we must always remember that anyone can hurt us. There might be a time in your life when you also won't have the advantage of saying you don't recognize somebody's vile plan. Your endurance may rely upon your remembering it. At the point when we acknowledge the fact that anybody is capable of evil, we are bound to recognize the attacker who attempts to con his way into our home, the youngster molester who applies to be a babysitter, the spousal abuser at the workplace, the professional killer in the group, etc. When we acknowledge that savagery is perpetrated by individuals who look and act like us, we disable the voice of denial and do away with the voice that murmurs, this person doesn't look like a killer. Chapter 4. Our knowledge of survival signals goes a long way in determining how we can escape from a dangerous situation. Several techniques can be critical surviving signals if we look out for them, some of which are Forced teaming. This is when an attacker tries to form a team with the victim by using words like we, us, etc. Charm and niceness. This is when the attacker uses subtle gestures and words to look charming enough to loosen the victim's guard. Typecasting. This is when the attacker labels the victim in some slightly critical ways, hoping that she'll prove him wrong. Too many details. Here, the attacker feeds the victim with too many unnecessary details, just to look calm and harmless enough. Shield yourself from crooks and criminals by looking out for nonverbal communication and utilizing sympathy to anticipate their conduct. There's a high chance that you've met somebody who can enter a room and feel everybody's presence. People like this pause dramatically by standing tall or attempting to occupy however much room as could reasonably be expected. Regardless of whether they know it or not, these individuals use nonverbal communication to radiate signs, and it is something hoodlums do, too, if you pay close attention. Conceivably savage individuals offer widespread hints that you can get on. Since most human gestures are all-inclusive and performed on an oblivious level, it is pretty easy to recognize these hints. By intentionally watching out for aggression and violence indications, you can keep yourself from being found in napping. One of the most well-known indications of violence is a jutting jaw. Men with bigger, sticking jaws are prone to violence in many ways. When you notice this, put some space between both of you and maintain some distance. Another hint is the flaring nostrils that are a predominant characteristic of inescapable viciousness. People with flaring nostrils are always trying to mask their anxiety by breathing hard and staring for long. Criminals are also always compassionate and nice to their potential victims. To counter this, you must also find a way to be compassionate since being on top of individuals' feelings permits you to survey the danger of being assaulted. Chapter 5. Putting ourselves in our attacker's shoes helps us make faster and better decisions regarding our safety. In case you're stressed over somebody turning vicious, a decent method to calculate the probability of an attack is to imagine their perspective. This means that you should put yourself in their shoes for a moment and try to imagine what they could do to you. For instance, imagine yourself in a position where you fire a representative and he's begun to send you compromising messages. If you take a look at things from his point of view, you can make an excellent attempt to make sense of his objective. If he wants to be reinstated, he most likely won't become dangerous, since that would demolish his odds. However, if he's surrendered all expectations and just needs retribution and revenge, there might be cause for concern on your part. On the off chance that you were ever harassed or bullied as a kid and looked for a way out, the most suggested solution would probably have been to square up to the bully. Bullies and forcefully fierce individuals feed on the fear of their potential victims. They prey on fear and intimidation on the part of their victims. However, when you stand up to them, they lose their leverage because you've overcome the only thing they have over you, fear. Using the cases of bomb dangers or hostage situations, 
we can see how panic works in favor of the perpetrator. If a suspected bomber calls in to warn the government about a bomb expected to detonate, the police and other available agencies would be deployed in a state of panic. In this instance, the caller is settled and excited because panic gives him more power and control over the situation. Imagine a situation where a bomber calls in to warn the government about a bomb planted somewhere. The first question should be, why is the person calling? Fortunately, there are signs we can deeply look at to recognize genuine dangers from counterfeit ones. For instance, if the caller uses a deep, guttural, and fierce voice, this is an indication that the principal reason for calling is to create panic and nervousness. Also, if the guest gives indication of being excessively passionate, this may just be an outlet for repressed indignation and age-long pain. However, genuine dangers originate from lawbreakers who are not always emotional and look as stable as you or many people around you. These individuals are patient and ready to stick around for their opportunity. Else, they could always have been unable to design something as sensitive as a bomb assault. They are brilliant, determined, and practical people. People whose daily lives look as much as yours. When you are faced with a difficult situation, calm down, think it through, and examine the odds of survival. Chapter 6. There's no common justification for violence. Anyone can get violent because of anything. In 1980, John Searing, a middle-aged man who sold craftsmanship supplies, sent the host of The Tonight Show, Johnny Carson, a letter inquiring as to whether he could appear on his show and enter with the broadcaster's well-known catchphrase, Here's Johnny. When Johnny Carson received the letter, he acknowledged it by signing his autograph on the envelope and having it returned to Searing. He, however, didn't honor his request to be present on the show. Searing kept on rewriting his request, and 800 letters later, he finally got his request granted. Feeling uncomfortable, Johnny Carson's producer had suggested that they invite the man over so he would stop writing letters. After the show, Searing stopped writing the letters and quit disturbing Johnny Carson. Searing's story shows that some stalkers are outrightly weird, while some can be very violent. An example of a violent stalking situation can be found in acts of mass violence. For example, the one at Minstrel School at Simon Stone in 1992, which could have been forestalled had upsetting signs been appropriately dealt with. If we fail to prevent a situation from happening, we might not be lucky enough to come out unscathed after it has happened. The main sign was when a suspicious package for a student named Wayne Lowe was delivered to the school. The secretary was uncomfortable when she saw the words classic arms on it. However, in order not to violate students' privacy, Wayne was allowed to pick up his package without any problem. Some minutes later, an anonymous call went through to the school management, warning them of a shooting in the night, but the matter was treated with levity. Unfortunately for them, Wayne had assembled a gun and he shot six people, killing two. Wayne Lowe's actions resulted from subdued and repressed years of anger, pain, and guilt. During his trial, he wore a shirt that said, Sick of it all, telling the world why he committed such a heinous crime. As the saying goes, things are not generally as they appear. What would make someone mad will mean nothing to another person. Chapter 7. We may get used to violence and abuse when we lose our sense of fear. Domestic violence is rife in our communities, and as much as people are speaking up, a lot of people are too scared to speak up or have resigned totally to fate. Drugs, liquor, and food aren't the only things that individuals can get addicted to. When it comes to addiction, too much pain can cause a lack of fear, creating a situation where the victim becomes used to the abuse. Humans are wired in different ways when it comes to coping with pain. Many people have felt too much pain that the little moment of respite they get is all they look forward to. To achieve that moment of respite, they open themselves to more pain, giving their abuser the power to control their happiness. There are many cases of rape victims who end up getting addicted to forced, rough sex because it's the only thing that gives them relief. This is the reason manhandled partners frequently stay in undesirable marriages. However, as time goes on, this sort of relationship kills the victim's sense of fear and intuition. When we continue to live in fear, we are at risk of getting addicted to that thing that got us scared in the first place. It's why abused partners find it hard to leave and even resist seeking outsiders to help. 
Some also see it as a show of affection, believing that the abuse is a way of establishing territorial and possessive advantage. When we find ourselves in these situations, we must first accept that we might be addicted and need help. That's why it's always advisable to run and call for help at the first sign of abuse from your partner. By continually living through brutal and possibly hazardous circumstances, domestic violence casualties no longer consider themselves to be in genuine danger. They lose the willingness to shield themselves or look for help from others. Once we understand that marriages or commitments are not a do-or-die affair, we'll realize why we have to leave an abusive relationship regardless of how much we love our partner. Did you know, on average, nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States? Chapter 8 an obsession with recognition and validation has led to teenagers making erratic decisions that can be very damaging. The programs shown in the media matter a lot, especially to children and teenagers. It doesn't matter if the children are sitting in front of the TV, playing computer games excessively, or tuning in to a lot of awesome music. The media plays a vital role in how they behave. Social media is where they all run to for validation. It doesn't matter what their decisions are. Teenagers of the modern world believe that acknowledgement is more important than achievement. The obsession with validation, recognition, and being acknowledged has pushed a lot of teenagers into doing crazy stuff just to get noticed. The general social media belief that no publicity is bad publicity has led many youths to their doom. In his book, Emotional Intelligence, Daniel Goleman depicts seven essential capacities generally gainful for people. The capacity to rouse ourselves, to endure against disappointment, to defer delight, to direct states of mind, to trust, to relate, and to control motivation. A large number of violent teenagers never learned these abilities. They always had it in them. If you happen to know a youngster who lacks all of the seven critical capacities listed above, such a person needs assistance and fast. Another indicator of violence is the ceaseless anger that is predominant in youths. When you encounter a kid that is always angry and furious at almost everything, such a kid also needs assistance. Kids who murder their folks are typically found to have been beaten, debased, sodomized, tied up, or tormented in different ways. We must always pay attention to our kids and watch their behavior as they grow up. Most times, they give us hints on what they are capable of. Even though his former school sent detailed accounts of his previous misdemeanors, Joey, a grade school student, still found a way to rape two boys in his new school. Joey's new principal had received first-hand information about his sexual lifestyle and his love for violence. Yet, the principal ignored these warnings, allowing Joey to sodomize a seven-year-old boy in the school bathroom. We must not let children get away with violence or erratic behaviors simply because they are kids. We must pay attention to the warning signs and seek professional help for the kid no matter the cost. Many of them are willing to sacrifice anything for fame. If we fail to correct bad behavior when we're young, we'll find it harder to change when we are grown. Chapter 9. Sometimes violence is more profound than what we believe it is. Our lives can be in danger without us having a clue. Violence can come from a place of hurt, and it's possible you're on someone's death list without even knowing the person personally. Michael Perry was a mentally ill patient who had an unhealthy obsession with one of the author's clients. However, his obsession was not for admiration, but for the hatred that developed in his mind from his childhood trauma. The author's client was a famous, beautiful movie star who had many admirers. Michael Perry grew up in a tumultuous environment, with his parents living in constant fear of him. When he was around the age of seven, his mother had pushed him into the heater wall, leaving him with severe burns and scars on his body. The encounter shaped his life and that of many people around him. For the act, he hated his parents so much that they started getting scared of his presence. They hid away from him and slept better when he wasn't in town. One day, however, he shot both his parents, a nephew, and two neighbors before proceeding to stalk the actress. The reason Perry stalked the actress was unknown to anyone until he mentioned it himself after being apprehended by the police. He claimed that in a movie, the actress had looked back in a scene that reminded him of how his mother looked at him when she pushed him into the wall heater. Such was his belief. He hated the actress for it and sought to kill her. 
Perry was willing to get rid of anything that reminded him of his mother, including planning to execute an innocent actress. When you study precise instinctive signals, assess them without denial, and accept that either the good or the negative result is conceivable. You do not need to panic, for you'll be notified if there is something worthy of your attention. Fear will only gain credibility if you use it to train your mind. When you acknowledge the survival signal as a welcome message, fear stops instantly. Thus, trusting intuition is the exact opposite of living in fear. Though the world is a dangerous place, it is also a safe place if we understand its basic survival skills. We are constantly surrounded by the things that could harm us or kill us. But on numerous occasions, we survive purely on instincts and intuitions. As long as we keep learning these survival skills and techniques, we will be able to live a better, assured life in a world filled with danger. Conclusion While it's true we live in a dangerous world, we can always create a haven for ourselves. Being safe is not only restricted to attending to a situation well, but it also involves understanding other people's perspectives beforehand to avoid danger. We've always made the mistake of creating or imagining the mental picture of what a criminal would look like. We've always judged people based on our expectations, and that's why we have failed to understand how criminals work. There are no peculiar gestures or behavior for a criminal. Anyone is capable of doing anything, and that's why we need to be wary of everybody. We must realize that some of the most dangerous people in the world are people like us, and to predict their moves, we must think like them. We've all been granted the gift of survival through experiences and gut feelings. We can predict a situation and sense danger miles away. However, we can expand this gift by learning more about how to spot danger and what to do to prevent violence. Try this. Whenever you find yourself in a dangerous situation, don't panic. As quickly as you can, think like your attacker and try to predict his next move. Doing this will give you an advantage over the attacker and allow you to plan your escape.